Once a month, we have the privilege to talk about the latest in the world of science with renowned physicist and Arizona State University professor Lawrence Krauss, who joins us now. Lawrence, good to see you there. It's great to be what here. Did you, what did you make real quickly? They're making these scientists in Italy, they don't predict an earthquake well enough, and they're off to jail. Yeah, science has become a risky business. It's amazing and so upsetting. The scientists used the data that they had for some small tremors that were happening in Italy, and they announced that they couldn't say that it was likely to have an earthquake there. And an earthquake happened, and they were tried and convicted of manslaughter and, and sentenced to six years in prison. It just defies the imagination, the, the, the fact that scientists using the best data tell the truth and then are put in jail. It just, it's just... Uh, it also, does it suggest that people have maybe more of a faith in different aspects of science and perhaps they should? Well, it means that people don't understand science. Yeah. I, re really, one of the great strengths of science is uncertainty and being able to state things with uncertainty. We, we can say something with confidence or not with confidence. What they could say is we can't say with confidence that there's going to be an earthquake. And so what, what really this represented, this travesty, is the fact that the judges don't understand science, but I guess we knew that already. Yeah, all right, <laughs> let's, uh, let's try and leave the solar system, shall Voyager 1, this thing was launched in the 70s, correct? Yeah. And, and now yeah. It's, it's, it's out of the solar system? We, it, there's new evidence that's come in that Voyager 1, and there's Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they're both heading out, that Voyager 1 has, has crossed the sort of protective bubble that the sun, uh, sort of like a placenta that the sun puts around the solar system. And the sun is pouring out charged particles and they're pushing out against the cosmic rays and, and magnetic fields that are coming in from the rest of the galaxy out to a certain region that's sort of the, the territory of the sun, if you wish. And as Voyager's moving out, one of the ways that we would know that it's crossed that boundary is that it's seeing particles coming in to it f from cosmic rays coming in one direction as opposed to charged particles from the sun, and it's seeing that. It's seeing the, the number of charged particles from the sun drop off, the number of particles from, from the galaxy coming up. The real test would be if the, the sun has these magnetic fields around it, and outside the magnetic fields would be in a different direction, and they haven't yet analyzed the data, but that would be the real smoking gun. But everything else looks like it's crossed the boundary, and it's the first human-made object to leave the solar system in in maybe 50 or 100,000 years, it'll be passing by the nearest stars, and, and um, it's going to continue to operate for another, that's what's amazing about these things, they were set, in 1977 they were launched, they're still working. That, well, I love that stuff. So what can they tell us about interstellar space, I and mean, well, what can they learn? Well, they, could, they can measure magnetic fields, they can measure cosmic rays, they'll be able to basically give us the first taste of what the environment is out there, with, with the two or three simple devices they have to measure it, and, and then of course once they once they die out, once the batteries go, they'll just be traveling quietly through the galaxy. And I find it very romantic to think of them, even if they're not uh, re-engineered by some alien civilization sent back <laughs> like in Star Trek. <laughs> just as long as they don't bump into anything out there. But, you right? know, if it, I, they could be, depending on what we do here on Earth, and who knows what's going to happen to us, I, I, it's, it's nice for me to know that there's some evidence somewhere in the galaxy that we existed once. That we were here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the nearest star. An Earth-like planet, at, in, uh, now where is this exactly? Is this, is this the nearest star to the us? The nearest star system to us is Alpha Centauri. There's three stars. And uh, Alpha Centauri B, so this is the very closest star to us. It's about four light years away. It takes four years for the light from that star to get to us. And I, I wish, I'm amazed because it turns out that that star has an Earth-like planet around it. Now, it's not an Earth-like planet you'd want to visit because it's orbiting the star every 3.2 days, and the surface temperature is about 1,000 degrees. It's, it's really close to the star, which is why they could see. You might say, you know, why haven't we found it before? But it turns out you can't see planets. Well, well generally you can't. Sometimes you can see them reflect the light from the star. That's how we see the planets in our solar system. But these small planets, we detect them by this amazing technique as the planet moves around the sun, its gravity, or around its star, its gravity tugs at its star. So as it moves around, the star wobbles a little bit. Huh. And you can calculate for this Earth-mass planet that it causes the star to wobble at a speed of 50 centimeters a, a second, about the same amount you, you'd walk. And it's amazing that we can measure a star wobbling at 50 centimeters per second, four light years away. I just so the, me away. So the star wobbles, if it wobbles a certain way, do we know the mass of the planet? Well, it, we or know, how far we know, the planet would be out from the star? We, we can work out the mass of the planet by, if, 
the, the speed of with it, the period of which it wobbles will tell us the period of the planet, how, how fast it's going around the star. And the amount by which it wobbles tells the mass of the star. And so that's how we know it's, or the mass of the planet, sorry. That's how we know it's sort of an Earth-like planet. It's an Earth-mass planet. But as I say, our period of our orbit is a year, 365 days. This is, goes around the, the star every 3.2 days. But where there's one planet, there yeah. can be more. And so to me, the fact that even the closest star to us has a planet around it means that it, there's probably there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. I suspect there's 100 billion solar systems. And if there are rocky planets around the nearest star, who knows, there might be another habitable planet. It's harder to find if it's farther out because, you see, an Earth-like planet, an Earth distance away, would cause the star to wobble once a year. But to see the period of the wobble, you'd have to measure it over many years. Yes. They could see the period because it was 3.2 days. They could see it wobble a lot. So if they, if they look at this star for 20 years, maybe they'll discover an Earth-like planet. So uh, if, if we want to find out more about this particular Earth-like planet that are in these, these nearby, st nearby stars, <laughs> these near, how long would it take to send something up there unmanned? Let's start with unmanned. Yeah, unmanned is the reasonable way to do it, I think. Well, as I say, the cur Voyager 1 is, is, is going out and... and in the galaxy, but it's moving very slowly. As I say, it would take 50,000 years. You could imagine with technology doing something that might take 100 years to get out to the nearest star system, 100 years one way, which is, which is amazing because it's sort of manageable in a human lifetime. Yeah. It's the first time when I realize there are rocky planets that I begin to think maybe humanity might send out probes that might actually reach uh, a habitable planet someday. It's, uh, I, uh, before that, it seemed like science fiction to me. Yeah, and, and, and again, of course, you'd hate to send something over to this, this Earth-like planet, and 50 years later, you go, hey, what about that one? That one might be more interesting. <laughs> you got to kind of commit, well, that, don't you? you well, yeah, but that's what's so good about unmanned satellites and unmanned <laughs> objects. They're cheaper. And, yeah, that's and, and true. People, you know, and you have to worry about getting them back. They're just very complicated. It's so much easier. Uh, I have a question from uh, Mrs. Simons, my wife. She's, oh. she's very into the scientific stuff, and oh, okay. she, I thought she had a really good question. I certainly couldn't answer it. Um, if, if, if energy is neither created nor destroyed, mm -hmm. which we all kind of learned way back yeah. when, um, what, what happens to photons? They seem like they, they're here, they're gone. When they get absorbed by your skin. Actually, it's not quite that energy is never created or destroyed. You convert energy into mass. And what happens is, and, ma and that's what Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, says you can take energy and turn it into mass or vice versa. And when I, the lights from, from your studio are absorbed in my skin, they actually make me a little bit heavier. The energy from those photons, when it's absorbed by the atoms of my skin and that energy is imparted to me, my mass actually increases a little bit. Not by a huge amount, but it's exactly that thinking. Your wife's thinking was great because it's exactly that thinking of what happens to light when it's emitted by a source and absorbed by another object that caused Einstein to develop his theory e equals mc squared. So she's well on the way. Well, don't, don't say that. Will you? Just, just <laughs> answer the question, will you, please? Um, but, but again, everything we've talked about today, it's, it's interesting, uh, especially regarding the Voyager 1 and this, this, this Earth-like planet. Yeah. I mean, we really are stretching out, aren't we? We're really learning things at a rapid pace. Yeah, and it's, it, is every, it seems every month when we meet, there's something new and exciting. And there is. That's why we have to keep looking at the universe. The, universe continues to surprise us, and I suspect that's going to continue. In fact, I always say, when I wake up, I'm surprised if I'm not surprised. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Back again next month? Yep. All right. You're we'll welcome. do it. Good to see you. Great.